So we've built up our API and learned a bit about stages. Let's go ahead and deploy our new API and see what the stage really looks like. So hands on, let's go to the API gateway in the AWS console. And we'll select our API that we've built up. And now we're going to go to actions and say, deploy API. Now we'll get a drop down here for the deployment stage. Now we should already have one in there that we created way back in the beginning. So we'll go ahead and use that prod stage that we created and click deploy. So here we have the stage editor. Now we've been here before, but you should see a lot of things that we've talked about in the stage overview lecture. So when you have some time, take a look around and take a look at what's in here. You know, we talked about caching and throttling and that's all in here too. So worth poking around just to understand where it all lives. But for now, we're just going to go to SDK generation. And for the platform, we're going to generate JavaScript because that's what we're using in our course. And we're going to click on generate SDK. It's just that easy. And we have automatically downloaded a zip file containing an actual JavaScript SDK for the API that we've defined for our chat application. Can't get much simpler than that, right? So let's go ahead and take a look at it. Let's unzip that. And take a look. So you'll see that we have a single directory called API Gateway JS SDK. And underneath that, there's a README file, as well as a lib directory, and this API G client.js script file. Now, that API G client is just generated just for your API. And if you're interested, you can open it up in a text editor and poke around, but it's really not that interesting. It's mostly just boilerplate stuff. So, not terribly educational to look at it, really. Anyway, uh, you will see the README file contains some useful information, so definitely want to take a look at that when you can. Specifically, it tells you what you need to include in your code to actually include all of this stuff successfully, so we're going to use that shortly. All right, so we have this all sitting there and waiting to upload into S3, so let's take care of that. Back to the console, let's go to S3. Navigate to the bucket for the course that you created. and click on the JS folder. And let's go ahead and drag and drop that in here. That entire directory that we just got. So we're going up to the API gateway JS SDK folder and we're going to drop that in there. Upload. All right, so that's where our example expects to find that folder. So that's in the right place. Make sure it's where it belongs. If you have trouble later on, make sure you double check the location of these files. So now that we have that there, we can start changing our site to use the new API client instead of hard coding all this Ajax stuff. So back to the resources for the course, we're going to go into V9 here. That's where we're at. And let's open up under the site folder under JS site.js and whatever editor you like. And let's take a look at what's new in here. So in previous versions of site.js, we had to define the endpoint that we were going to use to make the API calls. And we had to do that because we were using jQuery to make the Ajax calls. But now that we have a generated client, it actually has the URL of our API built into it. So we can just use that client now and not have to worry about my API URL being different from yours. That information is no longer part of this client code, which makes life a lot easier. So on line nine, you can see here that we're actually creating the API client itself, and we're going to use this now instead of jQuery Ajax functions. And you'll find the first use of that new client down on line 12 here, where we actually get the conversation list. Now you see that conversations get takes three parameters. It's not really a very interesting example of it because we're not actually using any of these parameters because get doesn't actually require any inputs, it just returns stuff. But if you were going to pass things in here that were useful, that first argument would be the parameters to your API. And the idea of passing in the parameters to the function itself may seem a bit circular, but it's not complicated. Any URL parameters or query string parameters or headers that are defined in the method request in API Gateway can be defined here. You don't have to separate them out. The client will just put them in the right places. You just have to define them by the name they were given in the API configuration. Now, the second parameter would be the body of the request if we had one. And by default, that's JSON stringified when it's sent, so you don't have to worry about writing the body itself. You can just create a JSON object, array, or primitive, and pass it in, and that will be serialized and sent properly automatically.
And finally, the last one is the additional parameters argument, if you had any. And you can use that to define any headers or query parameters that aren't defined in the API definition. This is especially useful for authentication headers. And I would suggest that query parameters should always be defined as part of the API configuration rather than passed in like this. Anyway, after the call is made to start the request, we have to define our callback function. And that uses the then function here. Now this function is almost identical to what we were doing previously. The one important change is how we access the data in the response. So jQuery would basically give us the result of the call as a JavaScript object. And if you wanted more detail, you could use different callbacks to get status codes and things like that. Now API Gateway generates a somewhat simple client, so the result passed into the callback encapsulates status code, headers, and the response body. Instead of just accessing your response data from the result, you have to access it from result.data. And you can see that here on line 15. Otherwise, the callback is the same as it was before. Now you can also look over the load chat and the send functions if you want to as well. They're, the changes to them are pretty much the same spirit as what we just did for conversation get. All right, so let's close that out and let's take a look at some other new code here. So again, under V9 of the resources, we're gonna go into site and take a look at chat.html. Go ahead and open that in your favorite editor. And let's take a look at the changes here. The changes are very simple. All we did was add all those script tags that were referenced in the readme file down here at line 54. So this is just coming out of that readme file of what to include and in what order. You know, straight up copy and paste there. And the change to chats.html is exactly the same, so no need to open that up because that's all that we changed there too. So let's go ahead and upload all of this new stuff into S3 as well. We're going to take everything under site and upload that into our folder here. So let's go back up one to the root of our S3 bucket here. And we'll say upload and drag in everything underneath the site folder in there. So that should replace chat.html, chats.html, and the new JS site a JavaScript file. Let's refresh this, make sure that it took. Okay, yeah, those look like they were just uploaded and we have the new site.js as well. So looking good. All right, so let's browse around a little bit starting with the chats.html. So as we've done before, we'll go back to our static site here and we'll slap on a slash chats.html. Looks like it's working, so uh, let's let's see. Here's the chat list. We have a conversation with Brian and a conversation with Frank. Uh, let's load one up. Start typing. Hello, world. Hi, Frank. How you doing? I guess I'm student now. Uh, hello, Frank. Hey, it worked. Cool. So it's still working. Uh, the application seems to be working just fine using that generated SDK for the client code, so that's awesome. Now there's one more useful artifact that API Gateway can generate for us as well. Let's go back to the API Gateway in the console. Doop. API Gateway. And let's select uh, stages under our API here. And if we select our stage, you can see there's an export tab here. That sounds interesting. So let's go ahead and click on that. And yeah, pretty cool. So you can actually export your API as Swagger, which lets you use it in other tools that are built around the Swagger definition of your API. Let's go ahead and say export as Swagger, and we'll use the YAML option for that. And that automatically downloaded a YAML file that defines our API. That's kind of neat. You'll also see that it has a copy of that information in this window down here in the actual UI, and that is the YAML definition of our client API gateway. Oh uh, yeah, so let's go ahead and copy that and see if we can do something useful with it. So control A, control C to copy. Let's head on over to editor.swagger.io. This is a place where we can play around with Swagger stuff. So in the editor on the left side here, let's go ahead and replace everything. Control A, control V with our YAML file. And the right side should change to show our API definition. Sure enough, it does. These look familiar, right? Conversations, conversation slash ID, etc. 
You'll also see an error, which is kind of interesting too. Um, the swagger that AWS generates automatically isn't always perfect, and that's okay in this case. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, but in any case, this swagger file, although it's not perfect, is enough to generate other clients that are not supported by the SDK generator. So if you need to write a client in some other platform that AWS does not support directly, you can use tools like this to do that. And you can even use this tool to try out calling your API. So let's go ahead and click on uh, get slash conversations, for example. And if we scroll down here, you can see that it actually did something. It's showing you the model associated with that call, and there's this big old try it out button. So let's go ahead and try it out. And then we can say, well, there's no parameters on this. Let's hit execute. And my gosh, it actually worked. We got back a response uh, that contains the actual data that's stored in DynamoDB on our back end. So that's kind of neat, huh? We actually used that Swagger definition exported from the API gateway to actually automatically create this uh, little client here within editor.swagger.io that actually works. And you could use this to generate clients in any other language that they support here. And there's a big list of them there. So if you need to write a Flash client or a... Uh, I don't know, PHP client, you know, this is a way to do that, just using that exported definition of your API. And again, that's an example of why it's important to have a well-defined API so you can generate clients like this automatically. Pretty cool. All right, so with that out of the way, I have a challenge for you, a little bit unrelated, but if you go back here, what we're gonna be doing in the next section is actually moving toward Cognito to actually let people log in instead of hard coding the username student in all of our code. So. We've successfully converted our API away from using Lambda proxies. Now we want to actually take this to the next step and get rid of that hard-coded student string inside our Lambda functions. If you go back to the console here and go to Lambda, you can remind yourself what I'm talking about. Let's take a look at, for example, a chat, conversa chat messages post. And if you look at the actual function code itself here, You'll see that we're actually hard coding student there, for example. And this is pervasive throughout all of our code because right now we have no way to actually log in. But let's take the next step toward getting ready to replace that with a real login system using Cognito when we actually have an identity system. So to practice what we've done so far, let's see if you can get a parameter called Cognito username onto the event in the Lambda functions where student is currently hard coded. So I want you to be using a Cognito username parameter instead. Now, the one restriction on this challenge is that you can't change any client side code. So you can't change the HTML or JavaScript to pass it into your API. So give that a shot if you're up for it, and I'll go over how to do it in the next lesson. Again, your challenge is to introduce a new parameter called cognito username and use that instead of hard coding student within our Lambda functions. All right, see you in the next lecture.